Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So this week and last week, I've had the, the luck to be here in Sao Paulo um, in this school about high energy astroparticle physics. Um, today, we'd like to talk about something that may be surprising to some of you, and is the fact that the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory is not only uh, a great place, of course, to do partic to, uh, particle astrophysics uh, and part an important part of the uh, multi semester program, but I want to engage to you the idea that uh, the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory is also a great place to look for fundamental physics. Uh, and the main reason for this is that we are currently observing the highest, the highest energy neutrinos we have ever measured. Okay. So uh, maybe it's a good point to remind ourselves that this year is actually uh, the anniversary of the periodic table. So the periodic table was one of our first ways to try to organize what we saw in nature. And we made so by looking at patterns of you know, different elements, have different common properties, and you know, we tried to organize them, and we came up with this thing. It turned out, of course, that this was not the end of the, not the end of the game. Oh, I think it, okay, not the end of the game. Uh, that actually a more uh, fundamental theories uh, were underlying, and in thus, I think it's a good idea to, to remember this. Uh, so we have, of course, the standard model, which has been incredibly successful. Uh, it has a more or less a number of parameters, but it has so far performed amazingly agreeing observable after observable that we have tested in. Uh, but the standard model actually uh, is more or less a complicated theory depending on how you say it and who you ask it. Uh, it's a very opinion dependent thing. But if you look at it, it has a very large content, um, it has very large particle content. Uh, and this number of particles maybe uh, are signal as some kind of structure, uh, in, in some kind of strangely, they tend to form groups of three, uh, and have some particular patterns. So maybe there is an underlying structure that goes beyond uh, the current standard model that we have, that we currently have. Another very large piece uh, that signals that maybe there is something beyond the standard model is that we know that the universe uh, has to contain a large amount of dark matter, and so here, you can see the budget, the energy budget of the universe. This is the binary matter that we know about and love. It's what is kind of a standard model. It's this big chunk of things that's not matter. We have uh, not a very good idea what it is. And then this is even this larger piece. So not only we're all in the quest of like maybe a more fundamental organizational way of the standard model, but we're also in the quest of these missing pieces. So in my research, and what I'm talking to talk about today, I'm going to use neutrinos. And I'm going to use neutrinos because neutrinos uh, are going to be particles that, in the standard model, uh, are misbehaving. And when something misbehaves, maybe it's because of some deeper reason. So maybe if we poke at them enough, we'll find the reason of their misbehavior. Uh, neutrinos are going to be interesting because they only participate in weak interactions. That means that if there are weaker and weak interactions, Maybe they can hint, uh, maybe we can see these ones. The problem is that that comes at a price. And that comes at a price that you actually need very large detectors to see neutrinos. Okay? So the misbehaving of the neutrinos is that the neutrinos that come in these three spe species, uh, electron neutrino, immune neutrino, and tau neutrino, which I will tell you why they're named like that, happen to be very light, though not zero, not, not massless as initially thought. Uh, so let me uh, tell you that there are lots of neutrinos in the universe, and we take advantage of basically all of them to study neutrino physics. Uh, right now, there are around 40 billion neutrinos just going through your thumbnail, uh, and these neutrinos have different origin. There are, of course, the neutrinos that are left, back, left from the Big Bang, and those are around 10 to the 9 per meter square cube. There are also the neutrinos that we see from the sun, uh, which is a, basically a giant uh, fission reactor. There are also neutrinos produced in supernova, where most of the energy is actually released in form of neutrinos. We actually can make also neutrinos in the planet. Neutrinos are often made, are constantly made, made in reactors that produce energy, and also in human-made accelerators. 
Finally, there are other two important places of neutrinos. Neutrinos are producing cosmic ray showers, so the high energy charged particles that every single time are hitting the Earth's atmosphere. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the high energy cosmic rays and the lately, more recently discovered high energy physical neutrinos. So what I was saying that neutrinos interact very weakly, uh, that I can actually quantify this. So you have a solar neutrino whose energy is of orders of MeVs, the neutrino proton cross-section uh, is of the order of 10 to minus 43 centimeters square. So you can compare that to a typical proton-proton fixed area experiment, and that's going to be of order 10 to the minus 24. That's a factor of 10 to the 20 larger cross-section. And that means that a low energy neutrino can easily go to 300 Hertz before interacting. And that's why I mean that they have a feeble in interaction. So when we talk about interaction in particle physics, we of course talk about or think about them as particle exchanges. So a neutrino uh, can exchange or interact with matter, let's say a quark, be an exchange, for example, a C boson, and you can see this in the Spiderman diagram. This we know as a neutrino neutral current interaction. A neutrino can also have what we call as charge current interaction. So in that case, the neutrino loses its, let's say, neutrino identity and becomes one of its charge partners. <coughs> When the neutrino uh, transforms via charge current, we can, we can then label the neutrinos by the outgoing partner, uh, the outgoing charge partner. And that's what gives us the three different neutrino flavors. We have the electron neutrino that's uh, connected to the electron flavor, the muon neutrino connected to the muon flavor, and the tau neutrino connected to the tau flavor. Of these three neutrino flavors, most experiments work with electron and muon neutrinos. Solar and reactor experiments produce basically large amounts of only reactor neutrinos, new, new, new um, neutrinos. Now, neutrinos are, of course, electrically neutral, uh, but we can see the neutrino by that exactly by the, by the signature produced by the charged particle. So when a neutrino is going to come in your detector, it will be able to interact. When it interacts, it's going to produce first of an electron and a muon. That's going to have either ionizing radiation, scintillator life, or Cherenkov radiation. Uh, in this talk, I just want to tell you that Cherenkov radiation will be important because that's the basic tool that we use in the ice cube neutrino experiment. And I will show you here a typical picture of an accelerator-based neutrino de detector. This is actually minimum. And so here you have a muon, and the muon uh, is going to enter into this detector. It happens to be an oil-based a Sharenkov detector, and in that oil based Sharenkov detector, the muon is going to produce this Sharenkov cone, and you can see this very nice sharp cone here. And using that cone, we can figure out uh, the muon uh, energy and direction, and thus infer the neutrinos. Okay. So most neutrino experiments uh, can be organized as follows uh, there is going to be some source of neutrinos. Uh, they could be reactors, they could be accelerators, they could come from the atmospheres of the sun. Uh, different sources of neutrinos are going to have different characteristic energy ranges. So accelerator experiments typically are going to have GV neutrinos. Reactor neutrinos are going to have typically MeV neutrinos. So there's a few MeVs. And the atmospheric ones, the most studied ones, uh, are, are actually being done up to tens of GVs. But I will show you that in this talk, we'll talk about neutrinos that are Typically, not what we observe, but they go to much higher energies. Like I was saying earlier, typically most detectors uh, are able to see or study only muon and electron neutrinos. And the reason for this is that the tau mass is very large, and it causes the tau neutrino cross-section to be suppressed. Uh, the tau, tau cross-section threshold is of order of a couple of GeVs, and the but this suppression is still significant, and the tau neutrino cross-section with respect to the muon neutrino cross-section is are reduced by an amount of at least 30% up to 100 GeVs. So uh, high energy tau, or basically the tau sector, is, is mostly unexplored. Regarding detectors, I mean, we have a variety of neutrino detectors. Uh, we have used oil, water, liquid scintillators, and the next generation neutrino experiments are going to use liquid argon. Okay, so there's a curious phenomena that was uh, basically stumbled upon that's something called neutrino oscillations. And I want to briefly describe to you what neutrino oscillations are and how those are parameterized. 
So neutrino oscillations are a phenomena in which the neutrino, as it travels some microscopical distance, is going to change from one flavor to another flavor. So for example, I have an initial neutrino source. My source is producing mu time neutrinos, so I know my source in its composition. And as a function of the distance, my, my type of neutrino is going to change. So in this case, I have only, I'm thinking about only two species, and so my mu neutrino converts into a new E, and back into mu, and back into new E, mu and so forth. So this pattern is basically means that the neutrinos have, must have some kind of internal clock. So they go and change flavor one to another, one to another. And that means that the neutrinos must have themselves some sense of time. And because of that, uh, we know that you know, if you have a massless particle, a massless particle cannot have a sense of time because it's going to the speed of light. For the fact that the neutrinos are changing flavors, uh, we, in, in, in some distance scale, uh, we know that they must have a sense of time and thus have a mass. And so the neutrino oscillation probability is going to depend on two parameters, um, and those are going to be a mixing angle that's telling you how much the conversion between one species and another species is, so how large this conversion amplitude is. And the other one is going to be the frequency of this conversion, and as I was saying just earlier, that's actually going to be modulated by the mass of the neutrino, or the mass difference between the neutrino states. So the neutrino oscillation is actually a quantum mechanical, it's a microscopic quantum mechanical phenomena that is very well described by this Hamiltonian. And this is basically the kinetic term of the neutrino Hamiltonian. So this is the neutrino energy. And U is going to be a mixing matrix that's going to relate your neutrino mass states to your neutrino flavor states. Uh, what's going to be relevant is just the mass difference between different neutrino mass states. And so basically you take this Hamiltonian here, and you can time evolve uh, initial neutrino flavor state by this operator, and that's going to give you your time of neutrino. Mm -hmm. So we do two types of experiments to look at, um, to explore the neutrino flavor um, um, phenomena. One of which is what we call appearance experiments, and one of which is called these appearance experiments. So in an appearance experiment, what you are doing is you know uh, you start with a certain known flavor, and you try to figure out if that flavor became another flavor. And so in that game, you're trying to make a detector so that you're trying to reduce the alternative flavor to, to explore as small, as, as small mixing as possible. In this appearance experiment, what you're trying to do here is you start with the same flavor, a some given flavor, and just yourself, is that flavor still there? So those are the kind of instruments we use to probe these mixings and these mass score differences. So we have done a bunch of neutrino oscillation experiments, and by that I mean we have studied the conversion between neutrino flavors at different uh, um, energies and at different baselines with different neutrino sources. And for that, we now have a more or less clear picture of why neutrinos change flavor. And the reason is that, as I was saying earlier, the neutrino mass states here, nu1, nu2, nu3, are actually uh, not aligned with the neutrino flavor states. But each neutrino mass state is actually a superposition of different neutrino mass states. So we know that there are three of these mass states. Uh, there is one mass splitting, which is smallest one. Uh, it's about this size, and that was measured first, let's say, by solar experiments. And then it's larger mass splitting, and that was actually measured by atmospheric neutrino experiment. <coughs> the sign of this mass difference, so the fact that this neutrino is heavier, lighter, and these two other mass states is actually not, not known, and this is known as the neutrino ordering problem. But the PMNS, uh, PMNS matrix, which is the matrix that relates the flavor and mass states, uh, is more or less known, and you can see it here. And if you remember from uh, flavor physics of quarks, uh, there's a similar matrix that also dictates uh, quark flavor mixing, uh, and that's really quite different this one. Uh, the one in, in the quark sector is mostly diagonal, whereas this one has very large octagonal elements. So in this picture here, um, we actually are missing two, two important elements. One is the sign of this mass score difference, which is the ordering problem, and the other one is the value of the CP phase. So it sounds like things are fine, that we know that these neutrinos are changing flavors, and we know that they have these mass score differences. Uh, we have measured their mixing angles. And these days, it's easy to think that this was you know, a very, very smooth trajectory. But this was not a smooth trajectory. And actually, along the way, 
the, of us trying to figure out the continuous word changing flavor, we we're often very confused. So I just want to remember of our confusion because that confusion hopefully will indicate maybe current directions. So the atmospheric neutrino problem, actually the atmospheric neutrino disappearance was observed already in the late 80s. So here I show you a bunch of experiments. Here's Kamiokande, IMB. Uh, and this axis here, R, is the ratio of uh, vertical, or uh, well, horizontal to vertical mu neutrino, mu neutrino rates. So as you can see that these two experiments here in the late 80s and early 90s already saw this appearance of mu neutrinos. The problem was that other experiments running at also the same time did not see a disappearance among these, these neutrinos. And this was a very confusing situation, right? Because this, this is a contradiction. So people tend to you know, believe in these ones and not in those ones. So then what happened is that Super Kamiokande actually was built and it superseded the Kamiokande detector. And you can see here that same plot, but updated. Uh, Super Kamiokande was much larger than this predecessor and it has much smaller error bars in medical systematics, and it definitely proved that this deficit was actually real. But I want you to note another thing. So here, you know, Summer Kamikandi, of course, was excellent in clarifying this picture, but also I want to point out that this was a especially confusing picture because the original Kamiokande result, which is shown here, this is the amplitude of the oscillation, and this is the scale of the oscillation length, is a factor of 10 off, basically, from the correct value. So this confusing picture then, you know, we kind of entrapped by a combination of the experiment having an incorrect result and needing to have a better experiment. Another problem was the solar neutrino problem. So here I show you uh, John Bacall's prediction for rates of solar neutrinos for different elements. So how he liked to make this plot. The theory calculation you should see is the bar in yellow colors, different components, and he liked to put the experiments just next to the bars. So you can see here that these different experiments uh, saw uh, uh, a clear deficit with respect to this prediction. But this was not enough, of course, to prove that neutrinos were disappearing. Something else needed to be done to solve the solar neutrino problem. And in that case, what happened is that we needed a better experiment. We needed an experiment that uh, was able um, to measure not only the electron type neutrinos, but all of the neutrino flavors. Uh, so in this case, you, you needed basically an improved technology to be able to figure out that you were conserving neutrino number. But that by itself was also not enough to explain why neutrinos uh, oscillated. Because if you try to just explain neutrino oscillations or oscillations using the simple vacuum formula I showed you in the earlier slides, you will get also a totally the wrong answer. So in that case, you know, uh, there was a required, required theoretical understanding of how neutrinos actually move through a dense matter or dense medium. And that required the interaction of the MSW potential. And now we know that solar neutrino physics can only be understood if we have included this properly. So the takeaway of this little history session is that you know, when you're trying to look for new physics, this always often happen when you have some kind of very confusing experimental situation. And that's what you want to prove. And then in the case of neutrinos, you know, new physics so far has been, uh, has been appeared by addition of some other terms to this initial vacuum Hamiltonian. So the plan is then to try to find you know, strange scenarios uh, within ice cube that we could follow through and try to follow these examples of the past. So what could you do? So I'm going to, in this talk, give you three examples of how you can do this within ice cube with TV neutrinos. So one thing that you can do is you can take your standard neutrino oscillation Hamiltonian, and you can add, for example, a new particle. So you can have additional neutrino flavors. They can have different kind of interaction with matter and can introduce novel flavor signatures. Another thing that you can do, you can introduce new forces, and these new forces can act differently within different neutrino states, and by adding differently, uh, you can induce new flavor conversions. And another thing that you can do is that because you know, neutrinos are a natural clock, This one, it's just uh, is the potential that the neutrino sees as it's traveling through matter. So it's a it's a matter-induced potential. <laughs> this is not the Lagrange. This is a neutrino Hamiltonian, but it's basically produced because of the interaction between electrons and neutrinos. Is it from the standard 
It is. That's right. That's right. So some of them, for example, when we're talking about new forces, there will be new terms in the Lagrangian. That's right. Yeah, I, w I will say more, more than me. OK, so uh, okay, so each of these things here uh, can be added to the, to the Hamiltonian and can represent uh, a new type of physics. So the idea is that then I will try to, to, to look for this kind of PSM-induced flavor conversion using ice cube high in Arduino neutrinos. OK, that being said, uh, I have to explain you what the ice cube neutrino observatory is. Um, so we are here in Sao Paulo. Uh, this uh, slide, I tried to make it to scale. So basically the size that you see here, so as you see here, should be approximately, approximately to scale. And so you can see that the Antarctic continent is very large, but also Brazil is also significantly large. Uh, so the ice cube neutrino observatory is located in this Amundsen Scott uh, South, Pole sta South Pole Station. So if you were to go to a South Pole Station, you will see this. Uh, this is the ice cube uh, counting lab. It's basically where we have our computers and our processing centers. Uh, and these uh, towers connect to the uh, main ice cube neutrino experiment. But you know, this, this lab here, this processing center, is not uh, the, the heart of the ice cube neutrino experiment. The heart of the ice cube neutrino experiment is actually buried about one kilometer and a half below the clear Antarctic ice. Uh, and it's comprised by about one cubic kilometer uh, array of detectors, um, which has been organized in roughly a regular grid. Uh, these detectors uh, have been organized in strings. Each of these strings contains what we call a digital optical module. Uh, the distance between one of these strings is approximately 125 meters. And among each of these strings, uh, we have these uh, PMTs, which have been encapsulated in pressure resistant vessels. Uh, and the separation among each of these uh, detectors is about approximately 70 meters. Uh, together with this array, we have also installed uh, a numerous amount of uh, calibration devices that will allow us to, uh, to measure the properties of the, of the Antarctic ice. Um, so just a quick signature of our dome. So this is just uh, eight inch PMT uh, in a pressure resistant vessel. Uh, and it uh, has its own data acquisition system. So it's, uh, it digitalizes the signal that it observes. Okay. Like I was saying earlier, uh, the ice cube neutrino experiment uh, is designed primarily, or one of its main uh, signatures is to see the sharing of light produced by muons that are produced by those neutrino interactions. So you have a muon time neutrino uh, that um, uh, here has a charge current interaction, produces a muon, that muon is going to produce a sharing of cone. And then by looking at the time of arrival of the light in my uh, ice cube neutrino array, I can figure out the direction of this particle, and we can do it with this resolution. So typically, most experiments will measure uh, the muon energy by means of measuring the length of the track of the muon. Uh, and you can do that as long as you are able to contain uh, the whole muon track. Uh, but these tracks, these muon tracks, are actually going to be tens or hundreds of kilometers long. Um, the good news is that at these high energies, when you have a TV energy muon, uh, the, there is a correlation uh, between the muon energy loss and the muon momentum. So what we do is we basically, uh, in this case, this is one of our event displays. So this line shows you from our detectors, uh, and the colors are going to show you the time uh, going from earlier times from red to later times from blue. So what we do is we calculate the direction of the muon, and then we sit along that direction and try to uh, measure the DDX to infer the muon energy. OK. So uh, our three uh, time and diagrams that are producing uh, neutrinos get then converted into signatures in our detector. And I would like just to say that, like I was saying earlier, these two kind of uh, neutrinos have been studied in many, many, many experiments, but tau neutrinos are less studied. And I will show you today uh, one of our first tau neutrino candidates. So, um, the, like I was saying, the three um, neutrino species get transformed into three topologies. So you can have, for example, charge current mu neutrinos, produce what we call tracks. These are these long lines. Again, the color is just the indicated time of the light. 
Um, the, and the resolution of these kind of events is about a factor of two. We find out the resolution of uh, one degree. Uh, then we can have also neutral current events or charge current LOE events that make uh, hadronic electromagnetic light uh, in the positions. In those cases, you know, we can figure out the energy of was deposited with around 15, 15 degrees. And we can try to estimate you know, the direction of this neutrino interaction with a resolution around 10 degrees. Uh, finally, we have a special way of seeing also tau neutrinos, uh, and we can do that as long as the tau that's produced of the new tau CC interaction is extremely boosted. And so, for example, you have a tau neutrino coming out this way, uh, it makes a very charge generated tau. And if that is long enough, we can start seeing this double bound separation. So you can see this kind of signature of somewhere around 100 TeV's. Um, so what does ice cube see most of the time? So here is a picture of the ice cube uh, high energy uh, mu neutrino uh, spectrum. So it picks most of our events, picks somewhere around the TV, and it keeps going up, keeps going up and down in energy. So uh, most of the neutrinos that ice cube sees uh, are actually going to be produced by neutrinos producing cosmic ray showers. And those uh, are just, you know, you have, for example, uh, um, um, a cosmic ray that, or a proton that interacts with an air, air and molecule. And it's going to induce a hydronic shower in the atmosphere. A hydronic shower, among other things, is going to produce pions and kaons. Those are going to produce neutrinos. Uh, those neutrinos produced from cosmic rays are actually going to be a very permissive background uh, for the search for astrophysical neutrinos, but at the same time are going to be one of our, our good targets. Um, so here, it, I was going to point out that this, this will come from all directions. So below, uh, a little below 100 TeVs, uh, most of the neutrinos that I still observe, at least in the mean time neutrinos, are actually going to be atmospheric neutrinos. So on those, I can look for new physics signatures because I can characterize very well the shape of this uh, component. Um, at the highest energies, uh, there are going to be neutrinos that come from high astrophysical sources. Um, and I want just to remind you that last year, I skip announced uh, the observation of a first uh, neutrino in correction of a blazer. And last week, uh, Kota talked about this in his, in his colloquium. Um, so these high energy astrophysical neutrinos are going to live here in this high energy tail. So we're going to try to use these two kinds of neutrino sources to try to look for signatures of new, of new physics. Both the ones produced in the atmosphere, there are lots of them, and they were understood, but their energy is lower. And at the same time, the higher energy ones, uh, which are less understood, but higher in energy. So some of the highest energy neutrino events have been found in Ice Cube, like I was saying earlier. And here are the pictures of three of the first ones that we found. Uh, we put names of them by uh, Muppet characters. So this one is called Bert, Ernie, and Big Bird. And so these neutrinos deposited in our detector around one PeV of energy. And currently, uh, the highest estimated neutrino energy we have seen is, is a 10 TeV neutrino that produces a track. So if you look at the highest energy neutrinos uh, uh, distribution, uh, you are going to find that there are not only these three events on this, in this plot, this is the energy that the neutrino reports in the detector. You're going to find that there are not only these uh, very high energy events, but there are also all of these, all of these 100 PV ones. So in, you know, often people you know, think that we are only seeing PV neutrinos. We're actually seeing a sophisticated neutrinos from 100 TVs and above. And one thing that's exciting that we uh, announced last year in a neutrino 2018 is the observation of what we think is the first astrophysical tau neutrino um, that we have seen. And the reason is that in the atmosphere, uh, the rate of tau neutrino is supposed to be very, very small. And so this is the event. We call it double-double. Um, so in double-double, uh, you see here um, the predicted, digamos, uh, let's say, interaction of the, of the, of the neutrino. Uh, and here, are these little panels show you the charge deposition in each of the domes very close to our detector. Uh, so what's interesting here is that if you look at some of the domes, for example, this one here, you will see that it has this double spike structure. And this double spike structure is produced because initially you uh, hit a nuclei, produce a hydronic cascade, also a tau lepton, and this makes the first bang, 
and then you have a second bank preserved down the lane. So we think that this tau had a separation of roughly uh, 70 meters. And right now we're calculating how, how likely this is to be a tau neutrino, but we think it's more than 90% likely. Okay, so um, the interesting thing is are that IceCube is a very high energy neutrino observatory, and actually the highest energy is the center of mass energy that we prove are actually similar to LEC. So we have two components that we can use for new physics searches, which I'm going to describe next. One is the atmospheric neutrino flux, and the other one is this astrophysical neutrino flux. Um, so let me let me um, let me start to my to my list of, of things that you could do. Uh, so one thing that may be reminiscent of the 90s confusing atmospheric neutrinos is the uh, the searches for for new new particles. Um, and so why do I say that this is a confusing situation? So even though the three neutrino model uh, seems to fit the global neutrino data, uh, not all the data actually fits uh, the observations. And the reason is that, as many of you will know, uh, there are experiments that have looked for mu neutrino to electron neutrino appearance, and seem some very significant evidence of that. Um, quoted at the moment, the combined evidence of mu to electron neutrino appearance is at the higher than five sigma level. Uh, the problem is that you know other experiments have not yet observed this. So one possible solution of these uh, anomalies is the interaction of a stellar neutrino. And so a stellar neutrino will be an additional neutrino state uh, that will not undergo any uh, electroweak interactions, so will not participate in those. So it does not have this. And how we often parameterize, how we parameterize a stellar neutrino is by adding a fourth row and a fourth column to our mixing matrix. Um, so stellar neutrinos uh, or heavy neutrinos do appear in many theories, but uh, unfortunately in the, in the mass range that these, these neutrinos are going to appear, they're not motivated um, by theoretical expectations. So if you look at uh, the different experiments that have seen signatures for this strange appearance of muon to electron neutrinos, and you plot them as a function of the neutrino energy, the experiment of the neutrino energy and the distance from the source to the detector, uh, you can put all of the experiments that basically have tried to look for this fourth there, for neutrino. Uh, so here, uh, the ones that are actually shown in red are experiments that have seen some kind of strange appearance or disappearance of flavor. And what is very strange is that not only these two combined are above five sigma, uh, statistically speaking, uh, significance over the no stereotypical hypothesis, but also that the experiments that have seen a signal seem to align along this line. Uh, and this is to be expected if the appearance of new neutrino states is due to a serial neutrino. Unfortunately, there are some experiments that have not seen that, for example, MINOS and PROSPECT at the moment. Um, so uh, you can do and you can, you can combine all the neutrino data that looks for this kind of stellar neutrino oscillations, and that actually um, you can predict the effective, let's say, mixing angle uh, between the active and stellar neutrinos, uh, which is this angle here, and the mass of the new neutrino. And so this mass difference is very, very different from the masses <coughs> that we've seen from solar neutrino experiments and of free neutrino experiments. So the best fit point solutions are, are very, very much favoring the neutrino hypothesis. But we do not, you know, we do not claim victory uh, because of the following reason. So when we looked at experiments that look for mu neutrino to electron neutrino appearance, uh, we get this region of the mixing of the active sterile and the mass core difference. Uh, whereas when we looked at experiments that look for mu neutrino disappearance, we looked at this difference. So there is no coherent picture that's able to explain all of the neutrino data within the standard neutrino framework. Okay, that being said, um, how does IceCube can enter and help here? So like I was saying earlier, uh, if you have a uh, two neutrino system, you can describe that by this Hamiltonian here. But now if you have standard neutrino, that standard neutrino does not have that intercurrent interaction term. And that means that uh, the active neutrinos are going to feel this potential, whereas the neutrino is going to not feel the potential. 
And that potential is going to be different for neutrinos and antineutrinos. But what matters is that you're going to have this new enhanced matter effect. And this is totally new because all of the other experiments that have looked for some neutrinos have looked at them only in vacuum. Whereas the neutrinos that Ice Cube observes, the atmospheric ones, have to go to the whole planet. So this is a complementary new way to look for, for certain neutrinos. And so what's actually neat also is that it so happens that if you take an, a neutrino of around a TeV with typical parameters compatible with Fresnel and this neutrino, there's going to be a massive resonance conversion between the neutrinos uh, that start from an active flavor to a stellar flavor. This is a, like the, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just, exactly. So here I'm just uh, introducing a new uh, neutrino state, so a new particle. Yes, it's a, it's a, it will be a fourth neutrino, but it will not be, uh, it will not have a corresponding charge partner. It's because, yeah, it's neutral, and well, it could be a heavy neutrino. You can also call it a, Heavy neutral lepton, do you want? It's not. It's not. It's not. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So the um, this this uh, this heavy neutrino or this stellar neutrino uh, uh, is going to is going to is going to be converted between the normal neutrinos that we have to this new neutrino flavor state. Um, and this is actually a special phenomena because it only happens when you have very, very high energy, so only in the TV energy range. And that's very nice because, like I was saying earlier, Ice Cube actually has lots of, uh, um, lots of events in the TV to tens of TV energy range. So like I was saying uh, earlier, in that energy range, for typical parameters that look for uh, or are compatible with uh, observations of mu2, electron conversion, you're going to have this massive disappearance of the mu neutrino type to the cell neutrino type. So uh, how it actually looks in the detector is a little more complicated because you try to measure neutrinos as a function of the direction of the event. So here is the um, uh, direction of arrival of the neutrino, and this is the end of the neutrino. So how it looks is basically somewhere around, this is the core of the planet, uh, you're going to see some kind of disappearance. Um, making the long story short, uh, we looked for this, and we unfortunately have found no uh, evidence for anomalous mu neutrino disappearance. And that actually has uh, increased the problem of the stellar neutrino solu solution. Uh, so currently, what we are doing is we're trying to optimize our, our results. Uh, we did this search for uh, stellar neutrinos using one year of data, and we want to move that to basically doing with almost 10 years of data. So that means we are going to go from 20,000 events to almost 300,000. Okay, so uh, this, this is actually kind of neat. Uh, we, we do expect to have new results on stellar neutrino searches this fall or summer, depends of, of your point of reference. Uh, but we're very excited to see if we find, you know, in this next iteration, some, some evidence of the lsd likes stellar neutrino. Uh, so another thing is these new forces. Uh, so here we're going to talk about dark matter. Uh, which is a known unknown. Um, so one thing that you can do is uh, in mind that you here have the planets, here's the galactic center. We know that there are astrophysical neutrinos. I was telling you earlier about them. Astrophysical neutrinos actually come roughly in equal directions to us as far as we can measure those. But in mind that there is going to be some kind of interaction between the dark matter and the neutrinos, and I'm going to tell you how that interaction happens in a minute. Uh, you could have then that the center of the galaxy becomes opaque, basically, to high energy neutrinos. Uh, so here I have the overlay, you know, the galactic um, dark matter column density is here lying in the center. Here are the position of our high energy, not highest energy neutrinos. So in this case of what happened in this kind of interaction, you will try to depopulate the center region. So you do need to have some particular way that you need to model the neutrino dark matter interaction. Uh, typically, people have looked at neutrino dark matter interactions in, uh, in cosmology, where they just assume that the cross section scales like S. Uh, but we wanted to, we are, we're aware of and these high energies, we could actually maybe resolve the microphysics between the neutrino and dark matter interaction. So in this case, we do this analysis in some more concrete model uh, to be able to, to, to compare our results. 
So uh, in this case, we take two simplified models. So in one simplified model, you're going to have the neutrino uh, have an uh, interaction via vector mediator with a fermionic dark matter. Uh, so this is similar to electrophilic C prime model. Um, and then in the other case we studied uh, is the case of having like scalar dark matter uh, with a fermionic mediator interact with the neutrino. And the reason this is interesting uh, phenomenologically is that this channel here has this S channel process that's going to make very distinct signatures. And the idea is that then people could look for other alternative uh, interactions and particular um, uh, Lagrangian terms, uh, but we just have decided to do this as a benchmark cases. So what happens when you actually introduce these kind of interactions? So there are two things. First, what I was advertising uh, is that you're going to deplete your expected neutrinos uh, coming from the galactic center. So here is the uh, declination, here's the right ascension in the sky, here's the galactic center, you see less things coming from there. And then depending on how the neutrino and the dark matter this, uh, interaction you put, you, that you put in, that's going to have different energy dependencies. And that, for example, in the case of these uh, s channel processes, you're going to have to, you're going to start putting in dips inside of the neutrino spectrum. Uh, so in this case of these searches, we are looking actually for a correlated uh, signature in, a, in, a, in, a, in space and in energy. Uh, so we did this with a couple of years of IceCube data, and we have put some constraints. Uh, how you interpret these constraints, let me just show you this picture for these kind of processes. Uh, it depends basically on what you assume of your dark matter mass, because that's going to give you your target density of dark matter, uh, and of your mediator mass is going to tell you, it's going to be related to the size of this cross section. It's also going to depend on how big these couplings are. Uh, well, because we have very, very few astrophysical neutrinos, uh, the constraints are actually on the weak side. So these couplings is the log of the couplings on in color scale. These couplings are rather large. But what's interesting is that there is some parameter space is, 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 is new, new parameter space being rolled out that's not been proved by cosmology. Uh, so we can bring some new things to look for dark matter, and we're, going, we're, going, we're trying to get um, competitive. Uh, let me just talk about new symmetries, and this is, uh, we do this in the context of uh, Alan Kostelecki's standard model extension theory, that tries to send the standard model to include possible Lorentz violating terms. Uh, and like I was saying earlier, uh, if, you, if the neutrinos uh, are taught like as a natural clock, uh, if Lorentz violation does happen, that clock is going to get distorted, and it's going to introduce new flavor conversions. Uh, so for that, we're going to use the flavor information of astrophysical neutrinos. So astrophysical neutrinos uh, are typically thought to be produced in three benchmark scenarios. In one case, we have a pion scenario where the pion decays into a mu and a mu. The mu subsequently decays, and then you see two mu neutrinos and one electron neutrino. And so we classify that as a one to zero scenario. If you have a source of astrophysical neutrinos that's a high magnetic field source, the muon will actually uh, radiate energy and will no longer decay plus in the neutrinos. Uh, you can also have production of neutrons, and of course, neutrons can decay, making new ease, and you can have a new galaxy forces. Uh, so then we often talk about uh, sophisticated neutrino flavor composition using the flavor triangle, and I just want to spend a second explaining how to read this plot because it can be a little confusing. Uh, this is the fraction of electron neutrinos, this is the fraction of muon neutrinos, this is the fraction of tau neutrinos. So if I have a point up here, uh, that means 100% mu neutrino, this means 100% electron neutrino, uh, and this means 100% tau neutrino. Uh, and if you're somewhere in the middle, how you're supposed to read this, you go horizontally to measure the mu neutrino content, this is the electron neutrino content, and this is the tau neutrino content. So this point, for example, in the center of the triangle will be equal flavor. Okay. Uh, so you can predict how different source compositions uh, mapped onto a flavor triangle. And so, for example, for the pion scenario, so you have pion decay that ends up being here. For the neutron scenario, it ends up being here. Uh, and the other cases, uh, for example, the muon dumped case, uh, somewhere over here. So uh, these blobs, though, uh, are um, given by the size of the uncertainties on the standard model uh, mixing elements. So that means that uh, and because we believe that neutrinos are produced by a combination of basically these processes, that means that if I measure a flavor composition uh, that's outside of this color blob, I'm seeing some anomalous flavor conversion that's not what we see at, at the planet. Okay. 
So uh, this is a result of our latest uh, search or measurement of a sophisticated nutritional flavor. And this includes the new tau event that I showed you earlier. So this double cascade here. Uh, so here is the, the result is shown in black. Um, and we are now uh, preferring a non-zero new tau fraction. But of course, you can see this error bar is gigantic. So zero tau is still quite a lot. OK, so um, now comes the the introduction of the variance violation here as an effective term in this Hamiltonian. Uh, so how we do it is we basically uh, are going to introduce some scale that's the scale at which the variance violation will be hypothetically broken. Uh, and then the operator that's going to appear in your Hamiltonian is going to depend on the dimensionality of the corresponding operator in the Lagrangian that relates the neutrino fields with the hypothetically Lorentz volatile fields. Uh, what is not known is how the neutrinos will interact with um, this Lorentz Boileton field, so the flavor structure of the new neutrino interaction is not known. Uh, so we can put some constraints on these kind of operators uh, depending on how they uh, affect the neutrino uh, flavor trajectory. So for example, if you have an E to tau symmetry in this kind of interaction here, that's going to move your predicted flavor from here to there. But for most of the kind of operators, we unfortunately cannot put, co put current constraints. Okay. Thank you. So um, I just want to tell you that these three examples show you how you can use ice cube TV and PV neutrinos uh, to try to look for new physics. And this is just kind of the beginning of our adventure because uh, we're going to we have two plan upgrades. So one is what we call phase one. And phase one is going to be a high dense uh, uh, array inside of our already dense array called deep core. Uh, and that's going to be installed sometime in the 2020s. Uh, the other one is what we call ice cube phase two, or gen two. And so here you can see the current ice cube detector. Here will be deep core. Here will be the phase one array. And this will be the gen two array, uh, which will also have all complementary detector. So this one has been approved, and we're going to build it. And this one still requires NSF approval. And like I was saying earlier, with respect to these flavor measurements, uh, which you know, are quite interesting, um, when we have the phase one completed, we'll go from an error of largely this size to an error of largely this size of this green balloon. So in that case, we're going to be able to constrain many possible operators, maybe relate or an induce anomalous flavor conversion. Uh, so conclusion, so we are indeed, I think, very interested in neutrino times. The short base anomalies are still there and unexplained. Uh, we have dark matter, which may or may not be related to neutrinos. Uh, and these it seems high energy, these operators seem to maybe be able to prove, uh, at least in these kind of models, pieces of the Planck scale size. And the good thing is that you know, the ice cube uh, program is continuing, and the ice cube update will happen soon. So your physics will be BSM. Or if that, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. So, um, questions for Carlos? So, the experiment has been going on for how many years now? It's been um, built in stages. So, we put one stage and we operate with it and so on. But it was completed in 2011. So, the recent detection of the tau, is that because of some new upgrade or is it just because you just happened to get lucky after eight years? Or what? That's a really good question. So, uh, one thing that we do periodically is trying to improve the understanding of the ice properties. So inside of each of our detectors, we have some LED sensors that we can flash every now and then. And we then measure the resulting light in another sensor. So using that, we can get better and better in making the ice. And so it's an improvement in the ice understanding that allows us to figure out this. So the question uh, connected to the previous one. So uh, you said that uh, the distance between two bumps is about 17 meters, yeah? But what is the sampling of your strings? Because, I mean, you extract this distance only just from the feet. Yeah, it's not really clearly visible by eye. So I that's true. So the, the, the domes within each string is 60 meters, 70 meters. But each PMT actually records the whole waveform of the events. And the PMT has actually nanosecond time resolution. So if you see an uh, event very close to it, even one single detector can differentiate the two bumps. 
because it records the whole light that you observe. And that's why you saw those two spikes there. Ah, okay. Well, the, the, the very, very good talk, thank you. So, high energy neutrinos uh, yeah. interacting with the ice cube detector can be considered as a kind of alternative source of the collider because, in principle, you can have a, up to one TV in the center mass energy. Yeah. So, question is uh, did you try to interpret your data in terms of new physics, for example, neutrino interacting with the quark when you, with the proton? can produce some kind of exotic particles like leptic quark or some whatever charge, new charge particles or well, kind of partners of dark matter, etc. My question is, uh, well, we, if you produce such particles in us cube, you will, they will decay to different tracks. I mean, how well you can separate tracks, how many tracks you can observe, and what is the length of the, say, minimal length for the tracks? Because you can produce some maybe long-lived particles, but not uh, stable ones. And, this is a great question. So, first of all, we have a measurement of the total neutrino cross section with nucleon by looking at the Earth absorption, right? So, we measure the Earth absorption, the neutrinos go just to the whole planet, and we know that just for the total neutrino nucleon cross section is we measure to within 30%. So, that, of course, is, is much larger than the expected QCD uncertainty, which is like 5% or so. Now, what you're saying is like, I have a neutrino interacting very close to it, and it makes a strange, like, double, double mu, for us, like, double parallel track. Um, so we have not redone, done, we have not done the analysis that looks for double tracks that are coming up to our detector. And we at the moment are not, I, I don't think there is a number I could quote for you of how well we could separate two tracks. It's going to, of course, depend how far away it happens, right? So this, these muons, you know, they can go easily tens of, of kilometers, right? So if the interaction point is far away, and if they are separated, let's say more than two or three strings apart, so more than 300 meters when they get to us, we will surely see that. In the other hand, if the interaction, okay, let me just draw this. So, it's, so if it happens here, and then this happens, and these are at the same time, this we will definitely will see. And actually, there's a paper with Mark Lindner where he talks about trident signatures, right? The fact that trident signatures on the neutrino trend production makes two tracks. You could see that here. This is the size of between two, three, right? <laughs> Yeah, at least. Now, if it happens closer, then you will not be able to separate. But yeah. Uh, okay. So if I, one is that we, we really have not looked at it. I know that at least in one of Manfred's papers, when he looks at trident production, uh, he claims that we should see a handful of these ones as a normal trident. Um, and we have not yet done the analysis that looks for uh, down go up to it. What we have done back in maybe 2010 or eight is look for not this case, but say in a cosmic ray shower, there was the idea that you could produce say a staus and those could also be parallel. So we have looked for down going tracks, but not for up going tracks, parallel tracks. Um, hi, so in your conclusions you wrote that there's, the experiment is sensible to Planck scale. So could you repeat that part? I didn't understand why you can explore the Planck scale. Well, this is, it's because if you, so we, we phrase this in this so-called standard model extension, right? So the standard model extension uh, is an effective theory that will relate some hypothetical uh, Lorentz violation, Lorentz, Lorentz violation uh, phenomenology. And in that uh, effective theory, you're going to introduce some kind of scale that this operator is suppressed by. But then my only statement here is that if you look at the size of that operator, that operator size is comparable to the Planck scale. More questions? I have a question about um, another experiment. So yeah. Anita has um, published results on high energy neutrinos. How does that compare with the uh, ice cube neutrinos? And where does it fit in the spectrum? If it's Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the good news is that I can tell you new news on that, uh, is that we have done an analysis of the percentage that ICRC uh, two weeks or so ago in Madison, um, and we looked at the time uh, where the NEAT events happened. And we see that if along the direction of the NEAT events, you see anything special. And the reason you have to look is like, okay, let me step up for a second. 
if you assume that the Anita events are coming from an isotropic population of sources, that's ruled out by limits from isotropic emission by ice cube and OER. So that's impossible. But you could still think is that maybe it's a transient source that's only specifically there. So what we did recently is we looked at the direction of those. Well, one event happened in 2006 within construction, so we could not look at that one. And we looked at the one in, I want to say, I don't remember the exact year, but we looked at the second one uh, at a time around it, and we also do not see neutrinos from that time. And actually what happens is that what you can do is you can compute, because basically these neutrinos, if it's come from a source, it's going to come from a burst, it's not going to come alone, it's going to come with other neutrinos. So if this neutrino that Anita sees makes it to the planet, it means that the accompanying neutrinos did not make it to the planet, and those ice cubes you have seen also. Uh, so we, at the moment, discard the interpretation that Anita is seeing either a steady neutrino emission or even transient neutrino emission. So what do you think they've seen? Uh, that's a real question. Uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Not a neutrino. <laughs> ask, ask them, right? They claim it's a neutrino. <laughs> okay, so uh, if there are no further questions, for, let's thank Carlos again for this very nice call. <laughs>